Howdy. It's been such a cool day. I have been learning some really cool things with the Lord. Um, Jewel is out of town. I spent some time with my two oldest friends in the world last night, two best and oldest friends. Um, and uh, and I felt deep, deep uh, love and deep sorrow and deep desire and hopes for these friends, you know. I. Um, yeah, love for them um, burns within me, and it and it and it sends me in many different directions, you know. And that can be that can be really exhausting. <laughs> that can be really exhausting, and sometimes that causes me to hide from the people that I love. Uh, just exhausted by the feelings that I have, um, and overwhelmed, to be honest, overwhelmed to the degree that um, I'm not liking um, what's pouring out of my heart, you know, from all of the 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 bigness, you know. And you're like, oh no what <laughs> is this good or bad or what hey get back here oh no my rope let go come back come back is that because i lost track of what i was going to talk about come here come here you. Uh, all right we got to go back to the tree to get my rope <laughs> that's amazing it just unclipped i was gonna float float all the way away all the way away okay but yes, so feeling all those feelings last night, um, you know, I, I went back to the Lord's Lordship and I went back to rest because of that, you know, and, and, and because, you know, he's Lord of my life, um, I can actually rest, you know, in that Lordship very practically for all of the things that burden me and burn within me um, and, 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 and vex me, right? Um, that um, that trouble me. Um, a, a word that I was learning in Hebrew today was the the word that vex is actually the same word for like a whetstone, like that sharpens something. And so there's lots of different things that I feel very deeply. And the way it seems the Lord looks at those things is that they're sharpening me, <laughs> the things that I care deeply about, even if they're um, you know resulting in um, a lot of uh, in showing a lot of immaturity, which is really good news for me. But um, this morning, you know, I wake up and I go to do my regular journal time and, and, uh, and, um, and I could just, you know, I just was kind of, I don't even know how to describe it. I had some crazy dreams, um, but I was just listening to, um, the Lord in my heart, um, this place that I can't describe. And some days I, I can describe it more than others, but some days, especially in the mornings, um, following my heart uh, feels very different than following my soul and um, and learning the difference between those two things has really helped a lot and and so kind of following my heart you know I, I got caught by um, Jeremiah seventeen ten, which on this one um, app was the verse of the day and it was just it just hit me you know and I and I was just you know, for as troubled as my soul can be sometimes, um, I, I was, I, you know, I've been through this enough to where I could feel like it will be, it'll be beautiful, you know, to go and look this up in the Hebrew, right? And so my soul's still kind of impatient and wanting to prioritize a million different things based off of what I learned yesterday or experienced yesterday or whatever, or dreamt in the night. <laughs> um, but uh, I could feel the invitation to just slow down and and uh and spend time with this scripture and and i think it's 10 words and um and you know i think i started this probably about 10 a.m i slept in a lot and it was awesome um i slept like nine hours um maybe maybe a little less but it was still great and i was it was really good sleep too best in a while and and uh and so i started this about 10 and I think I was done with these 10 words about um, 1.30 or 2. So about four hours, three and a half, four hours, just going with these 10 words. And I, and, I, and I knew that's what I was setting out to do. At least that's what I was intending to set out to do at the beginning. And so I, and it turns out to be what I did, which is often rare. <laughs> My intentions turning out to be what happened. Um, there's a lyric that we were laughing at yesterday that goes, um, 
It didn't go how you thought it would go. It went how it did go, and that's fine. <laughs> um, but in this particular case, it actually went how I thought it would go. Um, and so at the beginning, I wrote out the verse name, and I looked it up, you know, in, in the Blue Letter Bible, and then I wrote, um, I wrote the first, um, I wrote the first couple words, and, and it was amazing because as I opened it up, I saw, you know, immediately I saw the word mind, and I go to look at the Hebrew, and I'm like, oh my goodness, the word nefesh is not in here. And that is the usual word for mind that you see, uh, that, that usually in King James, when they translate the word mind, it's usually this word nefesh, which I've become like really, really close with um, as a word and a thought and a concept in life. But then I went and I saw this other, you know, word there and it was kilia. And, I, and so I look at what it means and I'm like, oh my gosh, this word, this word kilia, it's what I've been trying to describe as far as why you know when we are burdened we seek relief right and and the way that we seek relief uh when we feel a burden and the way that we um you know conceptualize what the, that relief you know would look like or what would have it and and and, the, and this word kill ya is that part of us that's feeling that and what's so cool is that it means rains it's it's actually this word that means rains like as in like the reins of a horse it's the thing that steers us around um and the context is that the lord tests it and so i immediately am like into that i'm like okay lord you know what what are you doing with that so then like i start kind of studying this and and it was the most wonderful time because like you know i kind of wrote the first couple words out just plainly because i'd already studied them before and then i went to these couple new words um that i'd never studied before and, and so i ended up writing you know a couple paragraphs about um, this word bahan and this word kilia, which is basically the testing of the reins or the mind or however, you know. And, and the scripture basically reads, I, Yahweh, search the heart. Test the reins. And then it says these, these, um, these five words. It says, um, Natan ish, Natan ish derek, Natan ish derek, Peri, Natan ish derek Peri, like Paris, <laughs> Natan ish derek Peri, Maala, 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 <laughs> Natan ish derek Peri Maala. And what those words mean is um, derek. No, Natan means um, this. It's it's wonderful. It's it's when, when the Lord gives um, or causes to receive. And it's actually when He gives the framing of something's existence. It's actually when that gift comes into into reality. He He created when He spoke, and and so it's really powerful when you hear this word Natan in relation to God that way because. Um, it's, it's what he did in the beginning when he was giving light and all of these beautiful things. Um, but then you have Ish, Natan Ish. And Ish just means mankind, right? But Ish comes from a different word, which is um, um, Anal, Anal maybe? Um, it actually comes from a, a word that's like um, um, Inel something which comes from a word anal or something like that and and what that word means is actually terminally ill um it's so fascinating that this word for mankind ish is rooted in the word to be terminally ill or or horribly sick but essentially it's a terminal diagnosis and and then this word um so natan ish he gives to this of, um, afflicted mankind. Um, derek peri ma'ala, which is um, the, the the English likes to put the word according to, you know, because we're very Indo-European and we want this thing to flow mathematically, um, so we want it to kind of build um, that way. And that's okay. Um, but I like to kind of pull those those extra words out sometimes because it steers my brain in a way that I I feel like is um, is too many steps forward. 
Um, I like to go back as far as I can and sit there and humbly, as humbly as I can, and that's why I read Hebrew stuff. Um, and and um, and this word, de these words, dedek, pedi, ma'alo. Um, dedek is this awesome word, and it's this word that I love, and I think about the Lord with this word all the time. It's it's ways. It's like the, your ways, your manner, the way in which you are, right? Um, another way to look at it is is um, the, the nature exposed by the journey you took. Um, you know, the line that you drew behind you while you were being out of the way that you are is like this word dedek. Um, and, it's, and it's what we, we look at when we learn um, and are fathered by somebody. And when we're fathered by the Lord, we, we look at their ways um, and their nature and it, and it teaches us teaches us in a way that we can't put words to, but it teaches us a howness um, that a whatness could never comprehend. And it's a very important word, dedek. Um, and then the next two words are fruit, which is basically just the 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 um, the whatness of a howness, right? When you go through and search up that search that whole word out, it's really just the product of the way that something was. <laughs> it's it, what it's what came of how it was that's what fruit means and and then this word ma'alo is um is is works it's the expression of the ways it's an it's 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 a nearly as a refined as a refined word um as as fruit is you know it's it's the invention it's actually is what means invention um, it's, um, it's, it's the, um, it's the invention, the works, the actual, um, expressed specific what of the how of a heart. Um, so it's very much like fruit, which to me, this is incredible because now we talk about the Lord, <laughs> I, Yahweh, am searching the heart, I'm testing the reins, and I am giving to man. I'm giving to afflicted man um, the fruit. Um, I'm giving to afflicted man of their way and nature um, fruit of what they're like. It's amazing, isn't it? It goes from this cascade of, from my, from my view, from spirit to heart to soul right? All the way to body. It's, it's this consistent progression. It's the way the Lord loves to talk to us. And he says it in the first commandment too: love the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind and with all your, with all your, um, might, with all your, love the Lord with all your leb, with all your nefesh and with all your might, with all your power. I can't remember the word. Um, but that's the first commandment and, it, and it's the way he is. And so it's amazing because there's this context, right? So there's the context of Jeremiah 17, 10, right? And then there's the Lord's reply to that context, which is contextually helpful, but also confusing. <laughs> it's contextually in the context of the, of that moment of Jeremiah 17, 10, um, in, informative and instructive for that moment, but it's, but it's so much more than just that like you that's what we try to do we we argue with each other about the interpretation right and so then based on those those 10 words i just told you people could interpret that so many different ways you could interpret it that um god tests us with the fruit um by giving us the fruit of our nature and to see if um, our own nature can hold up to that weight um the word test is amazing because it actually is this word that comes from um, like silvers and metals going into a refining fire, uh, a forger's forge and pulling out the badness. But it's also used in Job where he's saying, you know, I would like to see him tested to the fullest degree. And so what it's actually talking about is like if you took a person and imagined that that person was, you know, had the ability to be full of crap but also had the ability to be really wise. And then whether or not they, you know, they have that ability inside of them to be full of crap or to be really wise, they're saying and doing things, right? And so what this guy's saying is that he wants Job to be tested to the fullest degree, which what that looks like is actually applying weight on top of that person to see if they're full of it or if they're, if they're not. And, 
and to test them. And, to, and in, in that particular person's heart, it was actually to expose, you know, wickedness that they bet was inside of Job, you know, that they really bet was there. And, um, and, um, and, and so it, can, it looks like kind of, you know, that. And what that person's intentions with testing aren't the Lord's, in, you know, intentions with testing because he goes on and he says, no, I'm testing you like this. I'm testing you the way that, that a, 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 a blacksmith tests metals by putting them into the fire. But it's not for the purpose of destroying the metals. It's for the purpose of refining the good that's there. It's not for the purpose of adding weight so that way what's broken inside of there would be crushed. It's, it's so that way it would actually be exposed into healing. It's the nature of God to bless. It's the nature of him to, to bring things back into his original intention, which was to be blessed which was to have the original nature that he set forth in the beginning. And then there was this whole breakdown with sin that caused that nature to become fragmented in its instinct and its ways. And that's why now we have to test things based off of their direct, right? And so there's an interpretation that could mean that God's, you know, applying weight, you know, um, on your ways and giving you fruit out of that. Um, but there's also another interpretation that can come out of it, which would be, you know, that the Lord is actually not being presumptuous, um, even though he knows the answer and is still going through humbly a proper course of honoring somebody, even when he knows that they're wrong. He's that nice. He's humble and gentle of heart. The Lord's that nice that even when he knows we're wrong, he's still going through a nice, gentle, humble, uncompromised goodness, loving progression of, of actually going through a process of testing what he already knows and giving us the opportunity. And, I, and, and this is amazing too, because when you look at the way he actually acts toward us is that he, he reconciles even the broken stuff we do and works it together for the good because he wants it to work out for the good and he's capable of doing that. And that's a surprise. This is what relationship with God in the new covenant looks like with what Jesus accomplished with his blood. And that's the whole beautiful song of, of uh, and it is probably a song, Colossians 1, verses 15 through 20. Um, and so there's that, uh, that other interpretation, right? And so then we get all these interpretations and then we try to put it down into English, right? In our New King James or in our American Standard or in our NLT or NIV or in our ESV. And we all kind of argue about these interpretations and we think that's what it's about. The specific application that the Lord was responding to in that contextual moment. We think that's what it's about. And so we get, you know, exposed to the goodness of God. We get fathered by God's ways accidentally by his derek, which is hidden inside of this statement. But we might think that the context and what's important to God, you know, is different, right? And, but you learn throughout scripture more and more what's really, really important to him. And then it starts to change um, what you look for inside of what you read. And what I was realizing, you know, so much of what's like, there's, there's multiple things being conveyed here. But the most important thing that's being conveyed is God's own nature. And what he prioritizes is good. And the reason that's important is because we have a broken nature and he has a whole nature. Which means that our broken nature screws with our own perception of value. Right? So we need to actually be exposed to what he finds valuable in order to ask the right questions. But we're still so broken by this way that seems right to a man but leads to death. We're, we're um, you know, still, still, even though it's been so overt, we're still leaning on our own understanding instead of acknowledging him, which is what this is about. We don't, we don't understand how acknowledging him is con contextually appropriate for solving a problem. And that's because we're not thinking about it the way that he's thinking about it. He says, if you seek my face, I'll heal your land. He said, if you acknowledge me, I'll, I'll direct your paths. He says, if you keep your imagination fixed on me, instead of all of the, you know, understanding stuff, I will keep you in perfect peace, right? It, we, don't, we don't look at this looking for a caretaker. We don't look at this looking to become dependent. We come into this very independent, and so we're trying to solve it with our own understanding. But really, in reality, this is this is not what the the venue is. God's helping us to realize that we need Him. He's help. He's He's contextually framing things up in that regard that we're to be dependent on Him, right? And so we are dependent on Him, and so we're depending we're dependent on His actual example of what goodness looks like, in order to actually apply anything that He ever says. And that's why the things that He says. Um, kind of transform us. Jesus said, you've already been pruned by the word I've spoken to you. 
You know, he exposes us to these parables that express a howness and a nature. And because of that, you know, he had to talk to the disciples for so long, you know, with these parables they didn't understand. But it, it wasn't useless. <laughs> it was exposing them to a nature that then pruned them by the word that was spoken so that then he could speak to them plainly without using, you know, riddles and parables and stuff. And that's why they were so excited. Like, ah, you're finally talking to us plainly. And he's like, yeah, that's because now you're friends and not servants, you know? And, and it's really cool. And he does the same thing with us. And that's what it looks like to be fathered that way. Um, but yeah, I was just, I was just, you know, I, I'm, I'm, try, I'm starting to write this book and it's really exciting. It's really exciting. But the whole point of the book is this, this, this relationship with the Lord. And, and so then I got to a point where I just wanted to run away and spend time with this beautiful thing that the Lord was, was showing. And so then I, I sit and I meditate on his ways like this and it feeds me and it brings me into a place of real peace because I'm exposed to what God's like. And, and that, that has the capacity as your honor of who God is goes up, it increases your ability to receive from who he is. Right? It's the same thing. Like if you if you take a prophet as a prophet, you'll get a prophet's reward. But if you take him as like your neighbor, you're gonna get a neighbor's reward. You know, you're just gonna get him as like a nice smart guy. You're gonna you're gonna receive from that guy as if he was just a nice smart guy. But if you receive him as if he's a prophet, well then you're gonna get the reward as if he was a prophet. You know, you, the, the degree that you honor somebody is the is the ability that you can receive from them. And um, and so when you sit with this one, like man, his words are so beautiful. And like just in those ten words, man just takes me on an existential reorientation, beautiful healing journey. And uh, it just makes me enjoy him and love him and find myself at deep peace at, with, with God, you know? And, 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 and how, it's so funny because that's what I try to seek in the morning. I try to seek in the morning, can I remember with my understanding the principles that I was living under yesterday that helped me to have peace. And so I run around trying to lean on my own understanding with this way that seems right to a man. But when I go and I humble myself before the Lord and I just listen, and I just listen, I put myself in a spot where I can listen. That's why I like to memorize these Hebrew words because once I get it in there, oh, I have hidden my, your word within me that I might not sin against you. I, I have hidden to the best of my ability, the most accurate understanding that I have of what he said in just those 10 words in that one particular spot. And that's a treasure now. That's a treasure now. I've got it, you know, in this thing. And then I can lay here on this paddleboard in the middle of this beautiful place without any resources, without any big books or history or anything. And I can just humble myself before the mighty hand of God. I can cast my cares on him for he cares for me. And I can just acknowledge him and just chew on those beautiful, beautiful ways. You know what's amazing? is that he wants us to, to act like him and to copy him. <laughs> that's, what he, that's what he says for us to do. That's actually what it means to be a child. Like that's straight up, you know, the context. Like Jesus is always telling us, this is the behavior of a son. They only do what they see the father doing, you know? And we don't always see it that way. We bring it in these other contexts, but he's actually teaching us what it looks like to be a child of God, you know? Paul talks about, or no, it was Jesus again. And, and, and he was saying, you know, this is how you're proven to be a child of God because God shows grace to the wicked. So when you freely forgive, it's actually proving that you're a child of God when you act like God acts. So, so, so there's this beautiful thing of being a child, acting like the one that you're, you know, copying the direct, the ways of the one that's your father, right? And that's the way the Hebrews looked at it. Um, and so that was like really common when you'd see the word father. And I think like, you know, we don't always put it into that context. We, you know, are like, why did she call her husband father? You know, you're like, ugh. <laughs> um, but uh, but it's not the context. Um, and so it's really fun because this word um, test and also the word search, right? So the verse goes, I, Yahweh, search the heart and I test the reins. He's searching our heart and in our heart there are reins and those reins move us and steer us around in life, right? Um, but the word search is amazing. It's actually to explore and to just go seeking to observe. So it's like to walk around and take something in. So he's doing that with us. He's walking around unpresumptuously and taking in what is there. 
he's taking in what's there. He's walking around our heart and exploring like in, in like you know how we would in a new place and just or even in a you know a place that we go to all the time and take in what's there. Search, walk around and explore. That's what this word um, hakar means. Um, hakar leb. So ani Yahweh, hakar leb. I Yahweh search the heart, and I test the reins. I bahan kilia. To the word test, I talked about it a little bit, you know. But both the word hakar and bahan um, have this incredible meaning of tasting. Job compares it straight up to tasting. He's like, we test with the ears the same way we taste with the mouth. He said it twice. First time was a question, the second time was a statement. <laughs> he was like, don't we test with the ears the same way we taste with the mouth? And then he was like, we test with the ears the same way we taste with the mouth. <laughs> He's like, I'm, I'm saying it now. Um, and then the hakar is actually, um, the, the, the way that God searches our heart, is the it has the same word taste in it. To actually search out like a flavor and to go, move it around your mouth and look for what's in there and experience that thing. And, and so what's amazing about that is that we're to taste and see that the Lord is good. We're experientially invited to search the Lord's lep, to, to um, test the Lord's reins. And he says it in Malachi. He invites us to test him. It's the same word. Remember? And you're like, oh, you never put the Lord your God, you know, to the test. Um, this is this is different. This is a different invitation that he's doing, you know. He's not talking to Ish now. He's talking to uh, Adam. He's not talking to the man under affliction, this wicked one. He's actually talking to a redeemed man. And if we could understand the flip-flop of that, it's, it has to do with our nature. That he treats us differently according to that that nature. But the way he treats us isn't differently because he's still giving us the fruit of our ways. So he's still consistent. But as we change, the result of what we receive is different. The fruit of our ways. Man, isn't it so amazing just to meditate on 10 stinking words? It changes your existential relationship with everything. You know, it challenges all of the, all of the uh, leaning on your own understanding you brought into the thing. And it's so good to have that done. It's so good to be humbled before the mighty hand of God. It brings peace. Whew. But yeah, we're invited to like test his ways and to taste him. Taste him. That's what you're like. That's what you're like. And what happens? I am refreshed by good. And here's another one that you could take a million different ways. A man is refreshed by good by the fruit of his mouth. <laughs> Just go ahead and let that one, you know, if you get into the Hebrew of that, you're going to have the exact same thing happen. Oh, this is what I think I want to do with it. Oh, but this is what it's actually sh exposing me to. And that's what wisdom does. It recalibrates us and reorients us and actually starts healing our nature back into an Adam and out of an Ish. <laughs> um, and, uh, <laughs> and that's why Solomon, that's why Solomon talked like this. You want to know why? Because God talked like it. It said, God said that, you, David, you're going to have a boy, Solomon, and I'm going to be to him a father, and he's going to be to me to be to me a son. And so now you got Solomon acting like God, the one who, the, the Lord, who is perfect, who is the spirit of wisdom, whose words are infinitely wise. Now you have this man who's a, who's a, who's a son of God, right? It's amazing. And that's why, you know, Jesus called himself son of man. I always think that, you know, the coolest superhero to me right now would just be like, a human. I feel like if Jesus came now, he'd probably call himself human. <laughs> a real human. Um, but yeah, that's, that's my superhero, Jesus, the son of man, the real human. But, uh, but yeah, that's exciting, isn't it? And doesn't it make you want to like get to know your dad? You're, he's so cool. And when you taste of his ways, man, is it good? He's called the one who righteousness adores, right? Ugh, six, uh, no, it's not that. Uh, no, it's not there, I don't remember. But, um, but yeah, yeah, isn't that great? So I just love that, I love that. I love that, I, Yahweh, search the heart. I test the reins of your heart. 
the thing that steers you around. I don't even want to say in English the last five words. I don't. They're too good. They're too good as they are. They're just too good as they are. It, it's the perfect example of why bringing things into an Indo-European language um, steals from the original um, detail that was housed there. Netan Ishterek, Peri Ma'ala, Jeremiah 1710. Thank you, Father. Amen.